All right, it is Wednesday. Um, Wednesday, the 19th of October, 2016, and I am here um, at uh, the corner of uh, Southwest 5th and Morrison. And uh, it's not too busy out. There's a few people. I'll show you what's going on. Is coming right now. I lost my glasses. Um, I don't know where I left them. I think I might have left them at McDonald's or at home. Um, not sure what happened, but in either case, this is uh, that's the mall right there, and uh, that's Nike, Macy's, and that's Pioneer Square Park over there. And that's a Pioneer Square uh, courthouse. Uh, non denominational. Non denominational. I'm trying to start a church from scratch. Uh, so I don't have any members or anything. Oh, okay. On okay. Okay. Renaissance Cafe. Okay. That's all for us. Okay, that's good. The old on Saturday night. All right. Nobody do work on Sunday. Huh. I wish we could remember that. Um, as I was saying, I'm right here today. I came up with uh, with this. Uh, this is what I'm preaching behind. Um, I've made a division here with this poster board. Uh, this is the message to the church, the body of Christ, and that's to the world, the nations. Uh, the message that God is calling them to is to repent and receive Jesus as the gospel message of this life. This is what I've been preaching the last five years. And um, I added something different here. This is my first time using the board. Uh, it's the uh, ministry income from 2016, 2000 to 2016. I, church didn't support, so I want to yeah. remind them to be a cheerful yeah. giver. And I'm using the New American Standard Bible. So Show on, God. My Bible here. And, uh. Yep. Bob Jones. Show right. on, Bob. Oh, man. It's a really bummer here. But, uh. Somehow or another, I lost my glasses. I gotta start in a few minutes, in a minute here, as soon as I can find them. Ah, didn't find Just as I'm about to start, the black community decides to come out <laughs> to oppose, of course, not to support. I'll take that as a warning. Where's the police when you need them? So much for Black Lives Matter. So much for Black Lives Matter. And then when they get shot, <laughs> it's a whole different ball of there it is, right there. I won't go that other way. You don't need to see this.
Happy Halloween! Today is Wednesday, October 19, 2016. For some, it's their first Halloween. For others, it's their last Halloween. And for others after that, you've got years of Halloweens to, uh, to look forward to. I can imagine how many different ways you've celebrated Halloween over the years. Going to parties, gatherings with friends. But one way or another, we find a way to celebrate death. I think that's what Halloween is about, isn't it? The celebration of the dead. Some people, unfortunately, are afraid to die. And uh, the amazing thing about death is that we don't know when it's coming. It can happen at any time. A person could snap and in a minute, person could snap and in a minute kill someone, take their lives, a very life that God has given to them as a gift. Now what would cause one American to kill another? Resentment, envy, jealousy, hatred. At Halloween, we have an opportunity to do two things. Turn to God or turn to the culture that God oversees and help them in their celebration. At Halloween, you either turn to the gospel of God. If you're in the world, if you're in the world, you turn to the gospel of God. If you're in the world, you're in the gospel. You want to, if you're in the world, or if you're in the church, you turn to God in His Word. But if you're in the world, the encouragement of the church is to, to turn to God in His Gospel. This is the Gospel of God to, to the nations of the world, to those who are unbelievers. That's why the Bible tells us in Matthew to go into the world and make disciples of nations. You are the nations. You American whites, you Spanish Americans, you Native Americans, you African Americans. All of you people from the different nations and tribes, the gospel message is repent. Why should we repent? Because Jesus is the gospel message of this life. So God has an issue with us during Halloween. While we're sitting there celebrating the the the, uh, the dead or whatever it, uh, it it pertains to, I'm not really into Halloween, so I don't have a clue what it's about. But for those who are in the world, God is trying to reach you with His gospel and say, "You need to acknowledge My Son Jesus." But to do that, you've got to repent of your sin and. Jesus is the gospel message of the life that you're living. You're about to celebrate one of these holidays, but keep in the back of your mind that I have a I have a I have a bone to pick with you. And the bone that I have to pick with you is that you've re rejected my son and you won't repent of your sin, your arrogance, your pride. 
your white supremacist mentality, your hate, your rage, whatever it is that is in you that's keeping you from being my child in the Christian faith. To those of you who are Christians, that belongs to the body of Christ, what does God say? Pray without ceasing. That's why the sign is here. And I'm talking to the church, those who believe, the body of Christ, and what is the word of God saying to the body of Christ? Right? We need to pray. And so I'm calling the church here to pray for me and to pray with me to start a Bible study on a Friday night. Preferably somewhere in my apartment complex. There's a, there's a television room and uh, there's a lobby where people can sit and talk. And nobody ever shows up. I'm there every Friday. But unfortunately, nobody wants to be there. I don't know. There's something about the Bible that embarrasses people. You know, as soon as you go... Uh, secular, everybody wants to be a part of secular America, but as soon as you go spiritual and you want to bring the Bible into it as, a, as an authority, as God's voice, nobody wants it. Everybody just walks away. So there's an invitation here for the church to help me pray to accomplish God's work. There's also an invitation here for Sunday morning. So that would be a Friday night Bible study for the church and a Sunday morning worship service. But you can't worship all by yourself. You need a group of people with you. You know, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. Not even two or three. What's to gather and what's to meet? Everybody has their reasons for why they don't want to be there. Some people, the issue is subordination. This guy didn't subordinate himself to John and Patricia. This guy didn't subordinate himself to Guy and Gabriel. This guy didn't submit to the community. This guy didn't yield to the clan. This guy didn't give it to the gay side. I mean, there's always a reason why we can't follow this guy's leadership. He's a Haitian. He's not an American. He doesn't understand. God, when you stand before him, both church and state, only has one issue with you and I. The issue is his son, Jesus Christ. And when the name Jesus comes, it's either you are his disciple or you're not his disciple. It's, you are, it's either you are with Jesus or you are against Jesus. And in order to be with Jesus and be a part of a prayer ministry and a Sunday morning worship service, you got to repent of whatever sin you're holding back. To those that are faithful in the ministry of Christ and to those that are faithful in understanding and reading the word of God, the Bible says for us to be cheerful givers. In other words, support the ministry of the brothers that are doing ministry, whether they're in the house, whether they're abroad on missions trips, or whether they're right here, your local evangelist. Support the ministry. Not everybody is under the church's support. Not everybody's under a church elder board that is uh, assisting them in shepherding the church. Not everybody is, is on the same level. That's why you have infants that are newborn and great-great-grandmothers that are a hundred and something years old. So some are just beginning and others are just leaving. That's why when I began I said some people are, you know, we're in a month where death is being celebrated and some are um, not yet ready for death and some have already died this morning, right? And some have a, a longevity of time coming to them before that time. But one way or another, death is going to be celebrated this month. That's how I began talking to you.
God tells us in the scriptures, if you are the member of a local congregation, it's great to support those that are doing full-time ministry in the congregation that you are a part of as a fellowship. But God does not stop with just one church. God is not going to stop with just one body. That's why everywhere you look throughout Multnomah, there are churches everywhere. Because there are billions of you in the world, among the nations. One church is not going to take care of the billions of unbelievers, the billions of people who are being misled by Satan. One church congregation is not going to reach every single human being with this gospel of God. One church is not going to do that. That's why you, you have multiple churches and denominations everywhere addressing different peoples and different issues of different tribes, nations, languages, colors, countries. God will raise up one man to, to just evangelize right here in these four corners. Right up the street, he may be raising up somebody else. Uh, down the street, he may be planning a church building where they're having Bible study on the third floor or in the basement. So God needs as many ministers as possible because when the time of judgment comes, it's either you've heard the message and you rejected it or you heard the message and you received it. Nobody knows where you're at with God. So the board here is reaching out to both. The board is reaching to both. Those who are church and those who are not church. Those who believe you have an invitation to pray and to join me in prayer on Friday nights at a Bible study. Or on a Sunday morning we can start a fresh new group. You don't need a seminary degree to start a church. But you do need the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible says it is a good thing if a man aspires. The scripture says it is a good thing if a man aspires to the office of an overseer. But God is not just looking for those who aspire to the office. God is looking for people who believe. Believe his gospel and want to live for him. It's a lifestyle evangelism that God is looking for. Not just the pastor who, sit, who stands at a stage, but this is the stage right here. How you live is going to have just as much of an effect as those people you see on those platforms. How you live on a day-to-day -day basis, how you deal with sin issues, how you deal with a co-worker, how you deal with a spouse, a family member. So. Here are the two groups when God is looking at us. One group that does not belong to him, but they are in the world. And one group that does belong to him. And they are called the church. And you know that his first covenant with Israel. He's even calling Israel to be what? To become the church. So in the world here, you have Israel and the nations. And in the church, you have Israel and the church, those that are saved Jews, saved Israelites. So that's what this board is. And for those of you that God says, those of you that are Christians, and I'm specifically talking to the church of God, those of you that are Christians and who want to support his ministry, as a minister, that can there is for you to give whatever, pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, dollar bills, I don't know, a check for $2.5 billion, whatever ministry, you have ministries that are worth that much because God will take that income and take it to the nations of the world. If you check it out online, you will find those ministries. And God will reach generation after generation. We don't know how many people are coming in the future. We have no idea how many millions of people, you and I standing here today didn't even know we were coming. The people of the 17 hundreds and 18 hundreds and 19 hundreds didn't even know we were going to be here in this generation. The settlers who first came here didn't know that we were going to be here to read about their lives in past history. And so we should be grateful 
that were even here that we've been counted as part of this generation. So to this generation of both Christians and those who have not yet chosen Christ, the message is still that Jesus is the gospel message of this life and God wants us to repent of sin. And to the church, he still wants us to gather together to study his word, to pray, to meet on Sundays, the first day of the week, and to support our local ministers. And this is specifically to the church. So if you're not a believer, don't feel compelled because this isn't a ministry, you know, trying to grab your money. God is talking to his own here. As he is talking to you about your faith in Christ, which is what you should be worried about if you're not in his church. Being that it is Halloween season, I was trying to contemplate what's a good book to go through until Christmas or maybe until, I don't know, Thanksgiving. And I thought perhaps uh, First Peter might be a good book to look at a couple of times. So I'm going to begin with First Peter. But before I do, that was the introduction to this talk. Um, I just want to pray real quickly that God will bless our time and that you would be blessed and not cursed and that you'd have full understanding of what God is communicating here in His Word. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will bless this ministry, this outreach ministry both to the lost and to the scattered saints that may not have a church uh, to worship in. Father, I pray to the lost that you would cause them to repent and receive Christ as Savior and Lord. And Lord, I pray for those who are Christians that do not have church homes, that they would join me on Friday nights to, to pray, to study your word, and on Sunday morning to fellowship. I pray for those who have to be cheerful givers and to provide and support this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. What does the Apostle Peter have to say to us in this generation, 2,000 years later? Peter, as you know, was one of the foremost apostles. Peter is known as the apostle with a foot-shaped mouth because he always says the wrong thing at the wrong time. Peter was the apostle who, uh, at the crucifixion, cut off a man's ears because he didn't want Jesus to be arrested. Peter was a fisherman with his brother. And uh, he didn't want to leave the fishing industry because they were making money catching fish. But Jesus told them that I will make you fishers of men. Peter was the disciple that was forgiven by Christ upon his resurrection and was called to feed his sheep, feed his lambs, and shepherd his sheep. We know Peter in, in, his, in church history as the first pope. And thus he became the, he, became, he, he began the papacy that we have today. So the pope that we have is a sort of like a continuation of who Peter was. There are several other key highlights about Peter that you'll find in the Gospels if you take the time to read them. Either the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Peter was a married man. A man full of faith. So upon Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, Peter continues the ministry of the Lord. You'll find that information in Acts the first 12 chapters of Acts sort of give you an 
insight of what Peter's ministry was about. He was there in the um, in the room, in the upper room, when um, inaugurating the first meeting after Jesus had had resurrected. He was there when they uh, received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and uh, he preached his first sermon, which is recorded in Acts chapter two for the disciples after they had received the Holy Spirit. And he continued the work of the ministry with his partner, John. Jesus had paired up uh, Peter with John. John was younger than Peter. Peter was the oldest and John was the, was the youngest. Church history, from what I can remember, has Peter as living up to about the 60 or 70 AD, between 60 and 70 AD, around that time, probably around the same time as the Apostle Paul. If you want to look into it, you can you can buy historical books and church book, church history book that'll give you more accurate, detailed information about Peter's life. But as an apostle, Peter decides to write the church in Asia Minor, Asia Minor, which is what we call Turkey today. And uh, Peter writes a five chapter epistle. He, he wrote two epistles to the church. This is the first epistle containing five chapters, but I'm not gonna read all five chapters today, just a couple of verses to sort of introduce us to what Peter had to say to the church in Asia Minor. Peter says, this is how he begins his salutation. In chapter one, verse one, he writes, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia who are chosen. So Peter was an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is one that is sent with authority. When you uh, when you go back into the scriptures, for example, in Matthew, Matthew chapter ten, you see that Jesus chooses his disciples and sends them out by two, and uh, Peter is one of the 12 that he chooses and he sends them out and gives them instructions on what to do when he goes out there to minister to the people of Israel. Jesus tells them that uh, that they are to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and they are to preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They were to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. And he, and he reminds them, that is Jesus, freely you have received, freely give. We jump down to Matthew 10, verse 16. And Jesus says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be shrewd as serpents, and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. You shall even be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not become anxious about how or what you will speak, for it shall be given you in that hour what you are to speak. Then Jesus says to them, for it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Further down in verse 22, Jesus talking to Peter and his friends, or his the other apostles, says, you will be hated by all on account of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. And he says in verse 24, 
A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. He says, it is not, it is enough for the disciple that he becomes as his teacher and the slave as his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? Therefore do not fear them. Verse 28 he says, fear him who is able to destroy both spirit, soul and body in hell. So Peter was sent out as an apostle. And Peter was told, even though you're going to suffer these consequences, as an apostle sent out with authority, Peter, Jesus said to the disciples or apostles, do not fear the world, the unbelieving, who will oppose the gospel that you preach. Instead, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. At the beginning of this message, we talked about October being the month where of celebrating death. And here the scriptures tell you Here the scripture tells you in Matthew chapter 10 not to fear those people who can destroy the body. Those people who can kill the body. Not to be afraid of those people who can bring death to your life. I was watching a movie last night and it's called Restoration. And in the movie, this couple moves into this uh, brand new house, or this old house, and the man is uh, trying to restore the old house, and he finds a teddy bear. And as he's goofing around with his wife in the house, uh, using the teddy bear, she realized that there was something heavy inside of the bear. So she cut open the bear because she was a medical doctor. She used this knife and she opens up the bear and finds a diary. She reads through the diary and it's the diary of a little girl that used to live in the house. Apparently the house was haunted with her ghost. And um, as the, the story unfolds, we find out that uh, the little girl was killed by her friends. She was electrocuted to death. And she needed to be, re her spirit needed to be released. So she appeared before her husband, this woman's husband, in the basement and electrocuted him because that's what was in her and that's what killed her. Two of her little friends electrocuted her to death. And in order to get help to free her soul, she appears to the new owners of this house this old house and when he approached her trying to see who she was and that she wasn't an apparition of some sort she grabbed both of his arms here and here and everything that was in her that her body had taken in terms of electricity she passed it on to him and burned his arms so they did some research and found one of the parents of the children that was still alive in a mental institution and when they when they get into the mental institution they try talking to her to find out what happened and they weren't really able to get through to this woman but following some clues they were able to trace the information back to the very spot where the little girl had been electrocuted to death and come to some resolution as to what happened to her. But when they got back home and they were trying to get out of the house knowing that it was fully haunted, there were two other people involved in the little girl's life who had come back to life. And those people were in the apartment or in the house that was being restored waiting 
for this couple who had just been through this traumatic thing. So as the story goes in the movie Restoration, the, um, when they get back to the house after dealing with finding the little girl and where she was buried, her skeleton was there, they go back to the house to try to grab their bags and their money to, to leave. And this couple that kept on being nice to them shows up in their house with knives in hand and weapons to kill these people. So all the time they were being nice to them, it was because they had an agenda. And the agenda was to take the evil that was in them and put it in the woman and to take the man's life, which is exactly what occurred. So one man kills another and the wife kills both the woman and kills the man who killed her husband. It was a terrible, I mean, if I could have stopped the whole thing, I would have done it. But it was impossible because it was bound to happen because of what was in the heart of these people. Evil, right? Which is what we're celebrating here at this time of year. Which will be when? In October 31, 31st. So here in the passage, the Bible says, do not fear them. Do not fear the ones who can kill the body. The ones who can kill the soul. If those people had been afraid, they would have died at the very beginning of the movie. But they were taken by surprise. You see, death can happen at any time. You could have great plans for the day, for the week, for the month, for the year, for your life, and then out of nowhere, bam! Like those people, unfortunately, at 9-11, right, many years ago, which we just celebrated a couple of uh, last month, September, right, September 11. Out of nowhere, two airplanes come and destroy two business buildings over a hundred stories high. I mean, nobody that day expected to die. But here we are in the month where we are celebrating death. And here the Bible tells us what Jesus said to the apostles, the ones sent with authority, he says to them who have been sent with authority, they're not gonna stand with you when you go out there and preach the gospel. They're not gonna support the message that you preach. They're not going to embrace you. When you go out there, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. So you need to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. And he tells them, beware of men because they will deliver you up to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. They're not going to receive you, the nations of the world. They don't want to hear it. If anything, they're going to take you to court, prosecute you, falsely accuse you, make you sin like they sin, make you do what they do so they can turn around and say, hey, you're the fag, man. You're no different than us. You go into the place. You're the drug addict. Man. You smoke the same dope we smoke. Hey, man, you're the womanizer. I gave you my sister and you had sex with her. They're going to persecute you to be like they are so that they don't have to be guilty of their sin and repent of their sin. They're going to make you do what they do. They're going to make you live like they live. So the warning to the Apostle Peter was, you need to be as true as a serpent, as innocent as a dove. He says, beware of men. So he says to Peter, don't be afraid of the killers that are in the world that are rejecting this gospel. Don't be afraid of them. And this was before Jesus' crucifixion. This was way before Jesus was going to be crucified for the sins of the world. So he says to them, don't be afraid of the killers, of the murderers, of the butchers and those who enslave. 
those who oppose the gospel that I am giving you to give to the world from my Father. But he says, instead fear God who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So Peter write an epistle. And now he's talking in Jesus' position. Now that Jesus has ascended, Peter becomes the Pope. Peter is the man whom the people come to for information and instruction. And Peter fulfilling the words of Christ as an apostle, carries out the work of the ministry for all the years of his life until he is crucified upside down. God bless you, thank you. Thank you, church. So, Peter, like Christ, was crucified, but in honor of Christ's crucifixion, he says, can you put me upside down? Because I don't feel worthy enough to be crucified as my Lord was crucified. Peter does not want to have the same respect as Christ. So he says, turn the cross upside down. And then he took the hit and died. So here, Peter, after years of doing ministry, you know how he began in Acts chapter 2, right? Now as a solo minister with his partner John and the rest of the 12. I should say 11, and because Judas was replaced by Matthias, so they're back to 12 again. Actually, this is Gretchen Kafori comments, and I'm usually in the front line. Um, it is... Uh, take Columbia all the way up to 13th, and it's right there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm usually by myself. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me finish this. No, I was just asking that. I ain't trying to stop All right. God bless you. Uh, so, as I was saying, Peter did not want to be crucified the way the Lord did when it was time for him to die. Peter asked that the cross be turned upside down. So here, this apostle, who probably served the Lord for 30 years or so in preaching, calling people to salvation, raising the dead, healing, everything that I had read to you out of Matthew 10, fulfilling the words of God in Christ. Peter now writes a letter to the church that are scattered in Asia Minor. And he says in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. So Peter begins his letter by, by reading and saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He gives you his name and he gives you his title. He says, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen, so Peter is writing to the chosen, those whom God has chosen to salvation. Peter is writing to those who reside as aliens. And he says, we are aliens, we are strangers. Why do we, we become aliens and strangers? Why do the church become aliens and strangers? Because of the Holy Spirit. The spirit that comes from heaven is a strange spirit. It is an alien spirit. It is not a spirit that you and I are familiar with. It's a spirit that produces godliness in you and me. It's a spirit that produces Christ-likeness 
in all of us. It's a spirit that takes the unbeliever and turns them into a believer. It's a spirit that takes the unregenerate and turns them into the regenerate. It is the spirit that takes the, the children of the devil and makes them the children of God. So Peter is writing here to those who are chosen, those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Galatia and Bithynia and Asia, who are chosen, they're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. They are chosen by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. He says that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. What is he saying here? He's talking to the church. He says, he tells them and he reminds them, the fact that you are chosen by God, the fact that you are saved by God, you are saved, chosen, picked, according to the foreknowledge of God. It's sort of like predestination. God had predetermined, pre-chosen you before the foundation of the world. He had, he had already made up his mind in eternity past. Back in when the settlers first came, God had chosen every single one of us to be here. Prior to Christ's birth, when the Roman Empire was ruling over the Mediterranean area, and all the nations around it. The Father had already chosen those who were going to believe. His foreknowledge, his predetermined plan, foreknown, he had known in advance that he will, whom he was going to choose. In other words, when he looked at the earth from eternity past, he says, I'm going to choose her, him, him, her, him, him, them, him, you, all of you are going to be my disciples. So, what Peter writes here is to those people who are Christians. It's not whatever. It is what is written. It's not just whatever, it is what is written. So Peter writes to these people, these recipients, it's like if somebody writes you a letter and reminds you and says to you, you are who you are because God chose you from the past to be who you are today. You are who you are because based on the knowledge of God, who had chosen you, that is God the Father. But He chose you not because you deserve to be chosen. He chose you not because you were greatly qualified. You were chosen not because you had extra money in the bank or you were rich or you were beautiful or you were so well educated. He didn't choose you for any of those reasons, but He chose you by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. He chose you because the Spirit came upon you and sanctified you and set you apart. So it was a work of God. It was a work of God. It wasn't something that you chose, you know, I guess I'll choose to be the church because I'm so rich and so powerful. Uh, I'll choose to join this church here and they can use all my money. I'll choose this congregation so the people could recognize my fame or whatever. I'm so tall and beautiful and so famous and powerful and look at me, my pen is worth more than your house. So Peter reminds these Christians and he says you were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit by the Spirit of God coming upon you at salvation like the Spirit did in Acts chapter 2 when it fell upon them and there was like a flame 
the flame of the spirit above their head and they started speaking in tongues so he reminds them here he says by the sanctifying work of the spirit if the spirit had not entered these Christians in Asia Minor he wouldn't have written that in this letter he wouldn't have reminded them of the fact that they were God's choice and that God had chosen them before the foundation of the world that God had chosen them before they were even conceived in their mother's womb God had chosen them before their mothers and their fathers had sex or were even married and knew that they were going to be born this is before the, 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 the Genesis flood when God chose these Christians it was even before the Lord says in Genesis let there be light so you who are Christians today you're Christians by what? The foreknowledge of God. You're Christians by what? The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. So based on these two facts that you find here in Peter's letter, Peter now is the man. Uh, the Lord Jesus the Lord, the Lord Jesus is gone. He's up in heaven. So now Peter is the apostle of all apostles, and, and, and you know, he's got to write the church. So based on these two factors, he, there's a reason for it. Guess what that reason is? Guess why Peter reminds them that they were chosen? And Peter reminds them... So guess what? Guess why Peter tells them that they were chosen? Guess why Peter reminds them that they were God's choice? He says, one, because the Father had chosen you based on his foreknowledge, and two, the Spirit had done what? The triune Godhead is involved in this here, the choice. He says, the Spirit sanctified you and set you apart from the world. And he says, and the reason why the Father did this and the Spirit did that is that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. So now here you have the Trinity affirming the salvation and the choice of God for these people being Christians in Asia Minor. He says, why were you chosen? One, you were chosen because it was God who chose you according to his foreknowledge before the foundation of the world. Two, because the Spirit sanctified you and set you apart. Three, he chose you so that you can obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Who was Jesus? The Savior, the Messiah, the one who died on the cross. The one who spilled his blood at Calvary's cross to cleanse us from sin. Amen. Remember what the scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. Were they really going to be sprinkled with Jesus' blood? No, Jesus had died, resurrected, and moved on. It's a figure of speech. What, the, what those believers needed was not for somebody to come along and say, Hey, you know, I've got a little bit of Jesus' blood here in this container. Can I sprinkle it on you so you could be saved? Most people would say, get away from me with that blood. I don't want that blood on me. You know, I don't want, I, you know, come on, man. You're gonna, I just got this new shirt. You're going to put blood on it? That's not what he's talking about here. It's a figure of speech. The issue is obedience. He says that you may obey Jesus Christ and be redeemed with his blood and be redeemed by his blood and be forgiven because his blood was shed on Calvary's cross. 
and be set apart and sanctified because of his blood. That you may obey Jesus Christ. Obedience is the issue. Obeying Christ. And so here he writes an entire epistle as a leader in the church to give whatever the information is to the church what Christ wants them to obey. So the issue after affirming that they are God's choice and affirming that it was because of God's foreknowledge, affirming that they were set apart, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, now the issue is, you need to obey Jesus. Huh? Well, we don't know Jesus. We're way up here in Asia Minor. You know, you're down there in Jerusalem. You're, you're, you're the one who knew the man. We didn't know him. Okay, well, Peter writes and he says, hey, the issue now in the church is obedi obeying him. And this is what you need to obey him in. So he begins to write his letter. And then he writes, may grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. This is Peter's introduction and salutation to his epistle. Upon them he wishes grace and peace. Remember, Jesus was the Messiah that says, my peace I leave to you. Paul was the one that says, and by grace you have been saved through faith and not out of yourself, but it is the gift of God that no one should work, that no one should boast. God's grace and Jesus' peace. So by grace and by peace. And he says, let it both be yours in fullest measure. What were the disciples of Christ enduring in Asia Minor? What were the disciples of Christ enduring? What misery, what pain that Peter needed to write them this epistle and say, hey, His grace. You're going to need His peace. Therefore, I'm writing you this letter and praying that God will give you grace and peace in fullest measure. And He's not talking to just one Christian. He's talking to all the Christians in Asia Minor. Now, some of you are, are, are not yet there with the gospel and going, what is this man talking about? I don't even believe this nonsense. Well, hopefully, by the presentation of the gospel after we're done with Peter, you will believe this nonsense. But I'm going to stop here after these two verses. And um, pray that those of you who have not yet made the decision to follow after Christ, that God would soften your heart. Because there's also that issue of responsibility. You see, there's one side of salvation where it is based on God's foreknowledge that you've been chosen. But there's another side of salvation where the Lord calls you to repent and puts it on your plate to make the decision. Because remember what the scripture says in Acts, right? Acts. What the scripture says in Acts that God is overlooking the time of ignorance and is now declaring for all men to do what? To repent. So if the Lord is declaring for you to repent, He's doing what? He's putting the responsibility in your hands. It's your responsibility to repent. You can't just say, well, He didn't choose me based on His foreknowledge, so I'm not going to repent. I'm just going to keep living the way I've been living. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to go in the direction I wanted to go. I'm going to live the way I choose to live. So regardless of whether or not it's based on God's foreknowledge, you can't see things from God's point of view. But you can see the truth from how Christ and the apostles and the prophets have presented it. It's clear enough in the scriptures so that when you read it, you understand you and I have a responsibility to respond to his gospel. 
especially during Halloween time when everybody is celebrating dead, death, or the resurrection of the death. I'm not exactly sure with all these ghoulish and gaulish movies and things. You, it's like, what is this thing? Is, what is this thing about anyway, right? And so God does not want us to miss that this October. He wants us to be reminded that salvation is still a priority. Our salvation is still a responsibility. We still need to deal and wrestle with God like Jacob wrestled with God in the Old Testament. We still need to wrestle with the scriptures and work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Whether there's sin in our life or not, there's always going to be sin. Even after salvation, there's going to be issues that we deal with. But God is saying, this October, it's time to make the decision. Based on your knowledge of the scriptures. To repent and receive Christ as the gospel message of this life. Those of you who have ears, hear what the scriptures are saying. It's noisy. So the work of the ministry continues here in Portland. And the work is simply for those from the nations who have not yet believed to believe. And those of you who do believe and you are scattered and you don't have a fellowship, join a fellowship. Don't be afraid. Take God at his word. This requires faith. So you're saying this October, this November, what, what, what am I supposed to do? Uh, sir, I'm not talking about COVID. Yeah, you did, actually. I never said anything about COVID. You You said this November. I said this October. Okay. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about the gospel. Oh. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. So you're talking about... Standing here. Yeah, good, good, good thing. Keep going. I, I have another muscle patch. I'll stand here. No, you can. You can touch it over there. Stand here. Okay. You have every right to stand here. I have every right to stand here. Okay. I just don't want the opposition in my face. So I'm. So the question is, will you believe? Will you believe what God has said in His Word Why do you stand here? through His apostles? No, 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 no. Sir, I have the I have the freedom of speech. I didn't too. And the freedom of religion. I have this freedom of speech to talk to you. I, well, not while I'm do, I'm not while I'm working. Yeah, possibly, yeah. But, not is, while is I'm working. Is it illegal for me to talk well, to you? Well, I'm while working you're, and I'm asking while you you're professionally. Working. I'm asking you. Could you talk to me at another time no, while I'm, I'm doing right my work? Now. I'm, I'm, while I'm doing my I'm work. I'm asking you a question. Okay, and the, and the question is, I'm not interested in talking to you right All now. Alright, I'm not interested in talking to you either. Okay, thank you. Just... Okay, sir, be on your way. I'm right here. Alright. So the question is this, October, What's the question? is are you Here's willing the to repent what? What's he talking from your about? sin? He doesn't even talk about anything. He just fucking repeats himself. Are you a Klansman? Okay, so then what is your problem? Nothing. So then why are you opposing me? Are you making me? this a fucking black thing? No, no I'm asking no, you, what you, is the problem? I'm not, did you, why'd you ask me if I was a Klansman? Because I have done nothing to you. I'm I've doing my job as either. a preacher. I'm doing my job as fucking talking right here. Carry on. Is this really necessary? Pretty much, yeah. Black all day. Oh, okay, yeah, so do I. Yeah. Is this a black and white thing? Apparently. Fuck no. 
about a black and white thing. So then what's Are the problem? Are you going to make it a black and white thing? No, I don't because know. I want to know what the problem is. Nothing at all. Okay, then let me do my job. All right, do your job. Okay. Let me do my job. Okay, I don't know what your problem is, though. You don't have a fucking job. Call the police if you have an issue. I have no issue. Call the, call the police if you have an issue. issue. If I you have, have an issue with a, a with a black preacher, call 911. No issue with any preacher. Call the police if you have an issue. No issue. File a report with the, with the government if you have an no issue. issue. No issue. Okay. No issue at all. So carry on. So the word of the Lord tells us, and why do I do this? Because the Gospel of Matthew says, Go into all the world and make disciples of the nations. Because he has no other life. It's not my Gospel. It's yes. the Gospel of God. And the life of God says he should not be here right now. <laughs> Satan will deceive you. Yeah. And mislead you. Pretty much. And as long as you listen to the devil. Boom! Yeah, yeah. Hell. Testify, brother! Is that Testify! <laughs> What are you gonna do, man? Yep, in your face. She's got you right there. The white chick's got you right there. If you want to reject God's gospel, Woo! yeah, for your I sin, I don't want to at all. I love God. If you want to reject God's gospel, I love God's him God, so much. I want him to be for your inside sin. of me so much. I want him inside of me. If you want to yeah. reject God's gospel, Woo! yeah, that's fine. Yeah. If you want to mock God's gospel, that's also fine. Just like it says in Matthew, in the gospel of Matthew. I can do this all goddamn day, dude. Don't get out, motherfucker. Yeah. I'm right here, bud. Oh, you are? All right, so you're All day long. So Matthew chapter 10 tells us a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. Hey, you can buddy. You can try and help, bitch. The word says, do not fear them. Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You naughty, buddy. You were naughty. You were a little naughty. Yeah, you're an awful buddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, who are you? Do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged and misled by what God is saying to you. Those of you who are Christians, stay Christians. Those of you who are not Christians, God calls you to repent. <laughs> and what does God want me to repent? Nothing. Let today be your day of salvation. Nothing wrong. Let today be your day of salvation. No Preach, sister! Good. Yeah! Don't yeah! Why the fuck Father, I pray! Why are you standing here, dude? I pray that you will you, you, call these people to salvation. You have. Father, I pray that you will change the heart of the hard hearted. I love the hard hearted. Lord, I pray Go that you will cause the wicked Go beeps. to be righteous. Go beeps. Lord, I pray that you will I pray that cause the unbelieving to believe. Go Beavers! Woo! In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And in Jesus' name, we will continue to amen. preach the gospel. Amen. And in Jesus' name, we will amen. not be intimidated. And amen. in Jesus' name, we will not stop preaching the gospel because hateful people don't want to submit to your lordship Dear and repent Father, of their sins. We will not stop preaching the gospel because men refuse to humble themselves before your gospel. Lord, I pray that no matter what evil and Satan does, we will continue to preach the gospel in the house and outside of the house. Why? Amen. Why? What What are you doing? Why? Why? Dude, why? Practice your religion.